Welcome to Raised on D&D Podcast. Raised on D&D brings you inspirational interviews with tips and strategies to enrich your family's gaming experience. Your host for Raised on D&D has been a dungeon master for over 30 years and a father to three gamers. Here is Nick Cardarelli. Welcome back, gamers. I'm your host, Nick Cardarelli, and this is Raised on D&D. My next guest lives in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He's the creator of Beards and Beyond, the world's first and only beard base RPG. Founder of Plus One Experience, which makes beard bombs, lotions, and lip balms inspired by tabletop RPG culture. Please welcome the best-smelling guy at the game convention, Tony Vicinda. Hi, Tony. Hey, Nick. How's it going? Good, good. Thanks for being on the show. Uh, I am excited to be here. That is fantastic. When did you start playing tabletop role-playing games or D&D? So the first tabletop game I really remember playing, I mean, I remember at one point as a young child, Hi-Ho Cheerio used to be my jam, but I don't know if you remember the game Living Labyrinth, um, which uh, it was, you like slide tiles around and you have to maneuver guys through this this maze that looks kind of like a dungeon. There's no yes. role-playing aspects to it whatsoever. Some of the pieces are locked. Some of them aren't. You kind of pull pieces off, stick them on. I, I played... I played that game so much. It, it came back um, into print now. Um, mm-hmm. I, I loved it as a kid, and I could never really re- figure out why I loved it. Um, I do remember the first time I played Dungeons and Dragons. I was about nine years old. We were at a, I was at a friend's house. They had a box set. I was, uh, I was an elf ranger, right, which is the same thing at that point. Um, and so... Um, I remember playing it, I, I, and I remember it was a, a blast, and I, and I remember thinking this would be a lot of fun, but I could not remember for the life of me what it was later when I was trying to explain it to my parents, and they didn't know either, and so a couple of years went by, and some of my friends uh, in middle school were into role-playing games, and um, I, I started playing Magic and a couple other things, but never really got into role-playing games, and then when I was a freshman in high school, I asked my parents just, you know, for Christmas, if they would get me some, you know, role-playing books for Dungeons and Dragons or some of my friends uh, played Vampire the Masquerade and a couple other games. So I said, you know, just, just something I'd like to be able to play with my friends, get into this stuff. And uh, there was a local game store, which is the first place I ever bought a board game at. Um, and uh, my mom said she went there and that they didn't have any and they, they said they probably wouldn't be getting any more. And a decade later, it occurred to me that my mom grew up in Texas and was probably at that point in history still caught up a little bit in satanic panic because there is no way that the Texas game company did not have Dungeons and Dragons core books or role playing books on their shelves all the time. Like every time I went there when I was older, they had them and it just never really occurred to me. Like I just kept on going like, Oh, I guess I'm not going to be able to play. It never occurred to me that my mom who would probably refute this was lying to me because there is no way this game company did not have <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons books. And so um, I actually cut my teeth, um, you know, really on role playing when I was around 19. Um, and I started playing GURPS because I started doing some, oh, some yeah. demo work for Steve Jackson games. Um, and I don't know about you, but the first role playing game you ever play extensively, I think really shapes your view of what you think role playing games should be like. Absolutely. And so for me, GURPS, GURPS, I loved, I loved how you could build any type of character. I loved statting people out that I knew. I loved studying out uh, like different, different, um, you know, book or, or movie characters or just coming up and messing with different combinations. It's a massively flexible, deeply crunchy character building process. And then just lets you up to, to say, Hey, when you play, you roll 3d6, see if you roll low and you roll damage, you roll d6 to see how much damage you do um it's a very easy to teach system it's a lot of, a lot of player knowledge to take in to just build a character though and so um D and is kind of i feel like the opposite of that in so many ways and so every time i tried to get into dungeons and dragons i was just like i don't like it <laughs> <laughs> and so um which is my my deep dark shame i i, I told somebody earlier today um you know i probably only played actual dungeons and dragons maybe 12 sessions total. Um, and that's across like three different editions of Dungeons and Dragons. And so um, I tried fourth edition. Um, I, I didn't like fourth edition for entirely different reasons. Um, I played a, a couple of 3.5. I played through kind of a, a one shot series uh, and 3.5. And then I I played more fifth edition than probably anything else, um, which uh, has been with my, my kids who uh, my daughter loves it. Great. And uh, 
So Tony, fast forwarding, um, you're a husband and a father. How many children do you have? I have four kids. They are all preteens to teens. So uh, my daughter is our youngest. Um, so she's 11, but she's a great up. Um, and then we have our oldest who is 16. Um, and he, he, we have two in high school, two in middle school uh, right now. Mine are right in that. Right now they're 14, 13, and 11. They're right in that age where they love all kinds of role-playing games and board games and all that. Uh, how old were your children, though, when you introduced them to tabletop role-playing game? The first time we played a sit-down extended role-playing game, I want to say my youngest was nine. Um, so it's been, it's been about two years now. It may have been three years. She may have been eight. Um, and we actually, I introduced him to Dungeon World because it's just, it's really easy to grasp, um, really fun, really, really story forward, not as many details for them to have to pick out. She, my, my daughter immediately took to like voices and, you know, like character building. A couple of my sons are artists, so they drew art for their characters. Um, my oldest was kind of your typical oldest, so he, he was into it, but not too much. Um, and so we played for a little while. It was a lot of fun. Um, also introduced them to some of my favorite, like, just storytelling and world-building games, like The Quiet Year. It was like a storytelling map-building game that they all really loved. Um, a lot of other just kind of systems. And we usually do, like, a couple of sessions, and they would kind of die off, or we do, like, a night of just a one-shot. Um, and so um, we kind of rotated through quickly. No long campaign play or anything like that. Um, but for my older two... We have actually done a long campaign with some of their friends and some of my friends kind of all coming together um, that we played for about a year uh, right before we moved from Seattle to Philadelphia. And that was a lot of fun, even though um, my, my older two would sometimes get very attached to what happened in the game and we'd have to, have to, have to rehash it for like the next week while they, before we had the next session, which I, I think is a sign of a good session. I think when you're yes. talking about it for the next week, um, whether you're upset or not, um, I think that's a sign of good emotional things happening at the table, uh, convicting character choices and a desire to see things evolve in a certain way, which I think are all important to, to good dynamic play. Absolutely. We had some problems where grudges outside the game would come to the game table and then the reverse where grudges from the game table would come to outside the game table. So we, we, we've had both of those scenarios uh, with the children as well. You've created uh, Beards and Beyond. Uh, so what inspired you to go, you know what, I'm going to make my own role-playing game. So there are a couple things, and some of them are very pragmatic. I had done a little bit of game design a few times. I have a game that I've been working on for a long time. It's a tactical tabletop card game um, where you actually maneuver pieces um, represented by cards around the, the tabletop. Um, I have a brand building game called Brand Standing that we tried to launch, failed, and are going to put back up on Kickstarter later this year. Um, but my friends knew that, and I, I run a beard balm company for a living, Plus One um, does that. I also have another brand that I manage that makes beard balms. Uh, and so that's a big part of who I am. So they were like, well, like you should make a beard game. And I was like, well, what kind of beard game would you rather? You should make something you could just share really easily that would be just kind of help get the word out about like this new brand you want to launch. And so a couple years ago, I sat down and in a week at my local game shop around the table up in Linwood, Washington, I, I sat down and over the course of a week, just a couple hours a night in the evening would go up there and sit and I just jammed out a four page role-playing game called Beards and Beyond that was heavy on alliteration, very simple to play with a couple D6, and took elements that I liked from a couple of other games and wove them into what I would consider something new as a, as a whole cloth endeavor. So I'm, I'm a big fan of wordplay and puns, and so that made an appearance in the way that the skills work. Um, I like simple story forward systems. And so um, I wanted, I wanted easy stats. I wanted people who had never played a role playing game to be able to do this. And we wanted it to tie into beards. And so um, I just spent the week, um, you know, drafting out my ideas, refining the language on it, doing two play test sessions. And then we just drafted it into a, a little PDF and just kicked it out as a free download. Um, and, you know, you could give us your email address, we'd send you the game. Um, and that helped us build up, uh, we had it downloaded about 2,000 times. Um, so wow. 2,000 people downloaded this game. And, you know, out of that, you never know how many people play it, right? Um, so we just kind of let it sit. I didn't do anything. I had plus one in the back of my mind for a number of years and just hadn't been ready to pull the trigger on it yet. 
And then, um, you know, I was like, Zine Quest was coming up this year. A couple of my other friends, I was helping them refine their Zine Quest projects, which is this thing on Kickstarter where people create small tabletop content. And I was like, you know, I've gotten feedback over the years on what people liked about Beards and Beyond, what they didn't like about it, questions they had about it, things that needed clarification. What if I took it and just turned it into a, instead of being a, you know, a, a four page RPG. What if I turned it into a 20 to 40 page uh, zine? And so we, we got some things together. I started expanding the rules, refining things, adding an in input from people. And, uh, and, you know, we launched it last February and we funded within a couple of hours and then we ended up funding over 900% of what we wanted to do. We were about a hundred dollars sh- shy of a really big stretch goal that we never really fully got to announce at $5,000. But we're just going to, when we go to pre-sales, we're going to not, we're going to toss that stretch goal back out there. So when we go to pre-sales, if we can hit the amount that would have got us to that stretch goal, we'll announce that stretch goal as an objective also too, which um, is working with a major publisher on a couple of different things. So how, how, um, so you, you mentioned that you were wanting to do a 20 to 40 page RPG. So when it, when it ended in February, what, what, what ended up being the page count? So it depends on the version you got, but it's a, it was a 40 page RPG. However, we, we ended up realizing as we've gone through layout, like we're going to end up adding four extra pages to it. Just out of like our pocket, not, not anything else. Like we want some stuff in there that, that with all the different expansions, all the different other things we've added in, um, just need us to have about four more pages. And so, um, we're just going to pop up the size a little bit. So it'd be 44 for the basic, you know, normal so that anybody could buy. We did a special Kickstarter edition that has four pages that will never be printed in PDF or anything else uh, that'll go out. And then the PDF version will have expanded characters, some additional rules, other stuff like that, uh, that are pre-done. And that'll probably be closer to 60 pages um, when it's all said and done. So um, uh, like I said, it's been a blast to just kind of do that. It's been humongously stretching uh, because layout um, for a book is very different than layout for a piece of paper or other parts of graphic design that I'm way more familiar with um, and that my team is way more familiar with. And so, once a week for the last month um, and a half, I've gotten a new layout of the book that we just kind of continue to evolve and change and make adjustments to. Um, But it's been, it's been a blast to go through. So it'll be 44 pages for the the version that'll go out to market also too. Wow. That is incredible. The art is phenomenal. The guy, Johnny, who is my, my primary graphic designer, he lives and works in the Philippines. He's tremendously gifted and this has been a big stretch for him, but um, it was really phenomenal to have him as as art director. I get to work with him on a lot of other projects uh, also. But we got to do partnerships with Amaria Keel, who produced Rap Gods and has an RPG coming up on the One Shot Network's uh, anthology that they're doing. Um, I got to work with GM Jeff Stormer, who runs Party of One Pod. He made some wrestling-based uh, char- pre-generated characters for us, a heel and a face. Um, I got to work with my friend Alexi Sargent, who um, runs Clove and Pine Games on the Motif section, which Motif Building is I think one of the most underappreciated aspects that sh- I think should be in every game. I think if you're playing Dungeons and Dragons, I think if you're playing um, GURPS, I think if you're playing an independent small game, whatever it is, motif building is basically trying to ask questions that create a sensory experience for your players, but letting them talk about it and also inviting them to share how that that visual or sensory experience makes their their character feel. Um, or what they're experiencing. And so we actually built in a mechanic to help draw a lot of that kind of stuff out uh, within the game. And so um, uh, I've gotten to work with just amazing people on the project who I've been just tremendous to collaborate with. Um, Nick Nazaro from Layways Games did a page of the artwork for us. And then my friend John DeCampos, who runs Terrible Games, who lots of people probably have no idea who any of these people are. I got to collaborate with a ton of people, but I'll find it's John DeCampos, uh, terrible games um, is doing some artwork for a little adventure that we're producing to go with it also there too. That was one of our stretch goals. So um, that's the part I got the most excited about was getting to work with people on it. And I, I don't want people to hear it was a sales mechanic and think this is the Wendy's RPG. Um, <laughs> like, like there was intention and solid mechanical construction that went into the entire thing. Um, even if the stats are based on beards, because the stats are, Thickness, length, style, and growth. So thickness is your physical stat. Length is your mental stat. Style is your social stat. And growth is your reaction uh, stat and your recovery stat. So it's a mix of dex and con. Um, That's um, fantastic. So every character has some sort of 
epic but unique beard uh, yeah. that they're they're wearing. Yeah, um, yeah, and that and, and that impacts the game. Like that is how your character your character's stats are determined by their beard. Beards and beyond is it is it fantasy? Is it sci-fi? Um, what kind of genre does it fall into? Um, or is, or or is it like GURPS and you can make it? It is it is a hundred percent across genre setting. We did create a universe um, called the Whiskerverse, but the and the Whiskerverse is a place <laughs> you get pulled to through the power of the beard verse so you any beard and, and this is i mean I, you don't have a beard so you may not know this this is 100 percent true any bearded listener out there right now knows what i'm saying is the truth when when the rest of you sleep at night we get pulled into an alternate universe called the whisker verse through the power of the beard force um and we go on we go on daring adventures to fight off existential dread that wants to hold the razor blade of destruction up against the throat of humanity it's just what happens um and this is a way this game is really a way for everybody else to experience what we bearded people live through all the time so you could also think about it as a beard simulator also too so if you don't have a beard you can learn what it's like to have one but yeah people get pulled out of their normal everyday existence into the whisker verse um what your job is affects the skills which are basically every skill is as powerful as a spell they all work the same way um they can all be used to do tr- tremendously powerful things based on uh, wordplay, basically. Whatever your skills are, um, if you could reasonably use that skill you, through creative wordplay to apply to a situation, you can apply it. Um, and you can overload a skill um, to roll an extra d6 and have some sort of overdramatic effect by what which we call using the beard force to like um, to basically you know summon. If you're if you're a barista, you could summon a spectral pot of coffee to like drown your enemies. Like you know, like you may have to roll very high to do it, um, but the reality is that. And then everybody gets like an an epic item. Which so let's take that same barista character. You know, it could just be a porta filter, which is like the thing the barista hooks on and off the the espresso maker. But it could also be like the flaming porta filter of power, which is way more fun and tells the GM a lot more about how you want to use it. That's kind of your signature item you get to carry into the whisker verse with you um and uh and the fun thing is you can take traditional fantasy roles and you can be the thief the fighter the wizard you know this whatever you want to be you can do all those things but if you want to be the barista and the line cook and the professor and just very normal mundane roles they can be equally powerful but it lets us also port people into different settings so we're doing a steampunk eight page expansion as one of our stretch goals also too so it'll be we have and uh and we'll do we'll do a fantasy one in the future we'll do a cyberpunk one in the future um we so we have a lot of those things kind of mapped out but we also had one of my friends who's a comic book artist here in philadelphia um he's creating a map of the whiskerverse and it's just these islands floating in space and every island has its own theme and they all float around kind of the central uh tower um, that houses the the essential power of the beard force and that is constantly shifting inside. So it's an easy place to drop people for a one shot or, um, you know, you can hop from island to island and have cross genre play or you can just dig deep and say like, we really want to play classic fantasy. So we're only going to go to, you know, the Cilium Commonwealth and, um, uh, the follicular force. Those are the only two places our characters go because we want more of a grounded fantasy feel uh, and don't have to worry about anything else. So you can you can achieve a lot of things uh, within the system. And again, it's it's very story forward. It's very simple. Um, and the goal is to have people go on these amazing amazing you know adventures uh, and save the world through the power of their beards. And so um, you know it sounds it can sound very silly. And from the walk up, it is. And there's certainly a lot of fun to play. But if you want to play a more intense high fantasy version, if you want to do low fantasy, all these other things, you can kind of pull some of those different elements in based on how y'all want to craft your your universe. And so the the adventure hook we're writing is more of a sword and sorcery feel to it. So that is very very awesome. Got a lot of bearded friends that are listening to this, and they are super stoked uh, to be able to play this game. <laughs> You have this plus one experience, beard bombs and lotions and lip bombs inspired by a tabletop role playing culture. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So we're in the process of, of kind of developing our line. Like I said, I, I run another beard bomb company and I'm a huge fan of, of niche marketing. It's one, one of the other games we created brain standing. That's what it's entirely built around is niche marketing. Um, the, the idea of, um, of having kind of real world alchemical items that you can use as basically low key LARPing every day is kind of the feel of plus one. So our beard bombs are all based on classic role playing stats. So um, you no one else can see this, but you can. So we have like intelligence, 
and dexterity and constitution, right? That each have different aromas to them. They each have a little bit of a storytelling process. I just worked with my friend, John DeCampos. We're in the middle of a huge rebrand of the site. Um, and we created a character, uh, of like a tabletop Dungeons and Dragons style character for each of the bombs that are just kind of the embodiment of that stat and that brand. Um, and so we'll, we're about to redo all the labels and everything to kind of match uh, that feel, but they'll feel like an in-world item, like something you could give your character in a game of Dungeons and Dragons and say, look, like here's, here's plus one, you know, uh, intelligence beard bomb. Uh, if your character uses it, you know, it's got three uses in it. So for the next, you know, three adventures that you're on or for the next three days of, of in-game time, you can have plus one to intelligence as long as you apply, remember to apply this every day in the morning. Like you could do that if you wanted to. So the, the goal is to kind of create this feeling of these are real in-world things. So we're in the middle of, of developing the aroma profile for our lotion bar lines, but those are going to be class-based. Um, so they'll be like plus one to class skills and give you essentially proficiency in those areas. Um, our lip balms are all, uh, are all bard inspired. They're all kind of bardically geared. So they're like, words of power um so we have charm which is uh, is our rose one um and uh and um a couple different ones that we have put out that um are all inspired by different bard spells um some from dungeons and dragons some from other systems that we really like um also too and then we'll have some other projects uh, and products come out in the future um and then we'll also continue to produce games along with that the the biggest thing about plus one to know is that we actually take a portion of the proceeds a pretty significant portion and we pour them back into independent tabletop content creation so um, wow. everything that I do has a mission built around it like I I am probably the worst businessman in the world because <laughs> I, I want the money that I make to do good for other people uh, at the end of the day like I'm not I love having nice things. I love having a nice microphone that I'm talking into right now. I love that I have a Glowforge across the room that I can use on, on special projects. I love stuff, but at the end of the day, I want the money I earn to be in service of something bigger than myself. And so um, we, we regularly invest back in the tabletop role-playing and tabletop game community, especially for small independent creators, especially for RPG content. Awesome. Tweens and teens are getting excited about tabletop role-playing games and Dungeons and & Dragons, and they're actually going to their families and saying, can we play this together? So I have a growing number of parents who have no experience, no background in RPGs. Um, they never grew up playing D&D, and now they're kind of like, they've got box sets and they've got rule books, and they're trying to figure it all out. They're going on YouTube, they're watching how-to videos to play Dungeons and & Dragons, and, uh, and trying to sit down at the table with their with their children. So Tony, can you give a give those parents some advice on running games for kids, uh, playing RPGs with uh, with your family, maybe how to introduce it to them, that kind of thing. Sure. You can always go my mom's route, which is just lie to your children about the game store and the internet being out. Um, uh, I really don't harbor any upset of my mom about that. Like um, I, I love my life where it's at and I love how I came into gaming. Um, and so I just, it's just really funny to me. Um, the, uh, if you don't want to do that, I actually, so one of the major advantages, I think actual play is such a good inroads into learning how to play at home. And it's, it can be hard because you can create an expectation of like, oh, I need to be Matt Mercer from Critical Role or, you know, I need to be Griffin McElroy from The Adventure Zone or any of these other great outlets for storytelling. But I also like, you know, the, the advice that I think any of those people would give you is that as long as everyone at the table is having a good time and wants to play again, like you're doing, you're a great GM, right? You, whether you know the rules or not, doesn't matter. As a lot of time, those people who you will see who are hailed as great GMs will constantly get crap from, from Gronards and from other people who are like, that's not the rules as written, right? Like that's not, that you didn't do that quite right. It, it doesn't matter. Like the rule, follow the story, like follow the rules of the story, let things keep things on the rails, but, but don't feel like you have to be doing everything hundred percent right in the game. And you can give other people responsibilities for that as a GM. I don't feel like I need to know what's on everybody's character sheet. I feel like they need to know what's on everybody's character sheet. I need to know how to tell a story and how to run a game and how to propose things. And I think games are best when they're semi-conversational, you know, um, some systems don't allow for you to use different stats to roll different skills. But the reality is most of the time, if you're going to be doing something in a certain way, you can say, Oh, well, like I'm not really good at that, but I was going to try to do it this way. Could I roll another stat? 
sure, great, whatever. I don't like, that's fine because you can make it make sense and you can make it connect. That's not to say throw everything to the wind, but it is to say like, let your, let your players run their characters. You just learn how to GM if you're going to GM. But also I think a lot of kids are willing to do the work to become a GM. I know so many young people under the age of 13 who are running games for their entire family. So if you're like, I'm the parent, I have to work even if I'm still working from home right now. Um, I don't have time to really figure this all out. Buy your kids the source books. Um, become familiar with it. Listen to some actual play yourself, right? And just say, I would love you to run a game. And if they say, I don't know how to do that, say, say, neither do I, but I'm willing to help you find out. I'm willing to help you get connected. There are also great resources out there like Lazy Guide to GMing. Um, uh, I just read another one that's a primer on OSR stuff um, that I'm trying to think of the name of right now. I can't for the life of me, but if I remember, I'll shoot you a link so you can drop it down in the show notes that propose just kind of like from an, from an old school Renaissance mentality, how games should be run. Um, and a lot of it's like, you know, resolutions versus rules. So like you don't, you don't have to influence the rules every time. You can just resolve that this happens because you're the GM and you have control over that. So giving kids that kind of freedom and letting them grow in excellence, I think, is a great way to to not have to take all that on yourself, and but actually empower your kids who may be excited about that. Now, if you're trying to get them excited, right? Um, as I say, I think the actual play is we would also I'd play with my friends in front of my kids, so they would get a sense of of what's happening and how it works, and especially if it's adults that they like. Um, like I was playing um, microscope with some of my friends last night. We we're playing microscope to build a universe to then play more role playing games in. Um, and they were like, oh my gosh, is that, is that, his name's Cal, uh, is that Cal online? Like, da, da, da. like, how's he doing? I was like, we're in the middle of the game right now, but they were excited. He used to come and play in that session with my friends and my teens friends that I was telling you about. Um, but it, even the people, kids who didn't play in that session still love him are still excited that he was online with me and still want to know then what it's about. So you want to, you want to look at how you cultivate that curiosity and then what you can hand off that doesn't need to be your responsibility. Um, I think lots of times as parents, we think we need to be the experts, um, but really at a certain point, you have to become the learner for your own child. And again, you don't have to know everything. You're going to make mistakes um, and you can put things on your players that you are not good at yourself. And so I think those are all important things to kind of to kind of keep in mind. Um, the, the major thing I think that helped us though, the, the number one secret I have, it doesn't work right now, um, but I used to work a lot of conventions um, as, a, as a demo agent for Steve Jackson Games. And um, we would just have a day where my kids would come up and they would access whatever public areas they could. And we would just let them dress up as whatever characters they loved in cosplay. They didn't know it was a thing. They just knew they were getting to go out in a costume. And in their mind, that may have had connections to Halloween. Eventually, it had connections to just doing that. Some of them were too young to remember, so they were just in costumes. But but the feedback and excitement that other people had about seeing young kids engaged in that culture uh, definitely made my kids feel honored and seen in a really cool way. And so if you're going to a con, even if you can't afford tickets for the entire family, picking a day where they're going to come down and meet you for lunch and they're going to be able to cosplay a little bit as their favorite characters or just see the different things that are happening around you and meeting them at a nearby restaurant because we all know cons sprawl um, out around them that's an amazing, amazing way to get them interested and excited in the culture of tabletop uh, communities. But yeah, I think, I think also looking at what games you can play with them is another huge thing. That's fantastic. And that is great advice because I know a lot of friends that talk to me and they say uh, they feel overwhelmed. Like you were talking about, I'm working, I'm, I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to do that. Now I'm trying to become Matt Mercer at my home table. I've had to, I've had to, the biggest advice I had to give my daughter when she, cause she's the only one who's picked up the, the G of mantle so far um, was look, I know you have things you want to have happen, but you're not telling a story alone in this situation. So you can't decide in advance what the characters are going to do. You can decide some things in advance about what the, the genes are going to do. And I said, the other big thing was you need to start with a zero session. So sitting down a zero session, which is um, common in some role playing systems is not common in others um, is when you sit down and you basically say, here's the kind of game we all want to play. Um, and so being able to have that conversation, especially with kids means that they, they again, feel heard. So if you're GM and you hear, what are the things that they want to be able to do? Maybe they want to be able to do a lot of sneaky stuff. Maybe they want to be able to get in a lot of combat. Maybe they want to just do silly voices and have a good time. Like there's 
all kinds of things, but then being able to say, okay, well, what type of set, like, do we want to play in a science fiction setting? Do we want to play in a fantasy setting? What are some of the things we do or don't want in that fantasy setting um, are really helpful. It also sets the stage for when they're later to introduce things like safety guidelines for role play, things like lines, veils, X cards, stuff like that. Um, they're a little bit more common in like the independent realm or the actual play realm. Just the ability to say like, there should be lines when we're playing um, because we, even though we can acknowledge there's evil in the world and we can tell a story about overcoming that evil, we may not want to focus on that all the time. We may want to just be focused on what are, what's the good we're bringing into the world or any other number of things. So sitting down and having that zero session, building the world a little bit together, naming some of the cities, coming up with people's backstories and community. So you can say, I really like this part of yours. Can I connect in on that? Oh, you're from this town. I was also going to be from that town. Like, have we met each other? How do we know each other? Even if they, even if they don't know each other coming into it, having that background knowledge makes it feel way more lived in when you get to whatever your adventure hook is everybody sitting in a tavern and an old man with a map appears whatever it is which is fine but once you've created done that zero session to kind of build out the world together everybody feels like they know what's going on from the get-go as opposed to the GM coming in and saying here's a basic scenario now tell me what you do when you say why well, do X and they go oh no 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 that doesn't happen in this world well that would have been good to know before I built my character around whatever that is, you know, like, um, and so, so creating those expectations in advance, I think is, it's a fun session on its own, but it also gives everybody a little bit of input and lets everybody know what they're supposed to do the first time they show up. Yeah. And the, and it gives the players, uh, like you said, the opportunity to influence the setting a little bit, which it goes a long way in getting their buy-in. They realize my character lives in this setting um, and is tied to it in real social, maybe relationship ways. Um, they're less likely to burn that first tavern to the yeah. ground, right? There's, uh, a, there's a system called Blades in the Dark, which is about factions of thieves in this kind of... Um, this is kind of dark, gritty steampunk system. And so there's, there's a lot of meta social mechanics. Like when you do a job, if you do it in a certain part of the city, other factions are going to get mad at you unless you pay them off. Um, if you attack another faction, they're going to be saying some factions like you, some don't, and they all have their ease. It's, it's a lot of background bookkeeping by the GM. Um, but one of the, one of the things that it bakes into the system is you, your crew, which is actually like not just your party, like you can pull characters into and out of your crew because sometimes your heat, your, this is actually a mechanical thing. You track the heat your crew has. And if your heat gets too high, there's only one way it goes down. And that's somebody goes to jail. Um, and so when somebody goes to jail, they're out of the crew during that time. There's actually a separate way you can role play them. But you usually do that off screen with just that player. That player just drops in somebody else into the crew who they wouldn't always play with. And it's just a new member of the crew has been accumulated. So until that character gets back, you can play as them. And once they're back, you decide who's going on different missions. You don't take them both. You just take one. Um, but baking in a heat mechanic can be a really fun way to address Maybe some of the things getting out of control, just say, hey, I'm going to mark this down. I'll let you know what happens, you know, but if your heat gets too high, the local authorities might come looking for your party. And the only way to get them off your case is going to be for somebody to go to jail or have a trial and suffer the consequences. And so you just got to think about how you're acting. So you can introduce guards as more than just faceless enemies. You can introduce them as an actual authority in law in the land that when you violate the laws, you increase the amount of heat that you may have on your character. So there's a lot of fun, like it's one of the reasons I love pulling into so many different like small systems. A lot of them will introduce really fun mechanics that you can take into something like Dungeons and Dragons or GURPS or somewhere else and give a little bit more crunch, which I think for kids, the concrete nature of things like knowing like, you know, if I was going to do heat with my kids, I would, I would, make a circle in the middle and, and make like little cross hatches. Maybe I'd make like eight pie segments on that circle, which is called a clock. Um, and every time their heat went up, I would mark it up so that they, they as players would know, Oh, you're getting in trouble. And once it gets to eight, like there's going to be a consequence. So they can actually manage like, Hey, we're going to take this week easy and hope like, hope that we do it. Or we're going to move to a different area so that we're maybe where we were not in trouble, which maybe, maybe increases the hoboing part, but not the murder part, you know? Um, so you can make some of those things just, you know, public knowledge for them to, to help them understand consequences, which I think is such a good, a good tool for kids to understand those types of behaviors have those consequences. And talking about that, we've noticed that these kind of games that are scenario based that allow us to kind of explore 
options that only have in-game consequences, they benefit us immensely in the real world, whether you call it critical thinking, whether you, whether it's with create, creative problem solving, whatever, um, whatever title you want to give to it, these kind of scenario-based games uh, highly advance uh, our ability to look at a situation and say, how, how, how can I how can I resolve this issue with the resources I have on hand? Yeah. But what, what other skills though uh, are you hoping that your children take from the tabletop and, uh, and take back into the real world with them? Yeah. So um, I think it's kind of twofold. I'll, I'll give the kind of the, <laughs> the creative response first, as we inch closer to a potential apocalypse in our world. Um, I feel like, you know, storytelling is really the way of the future. And so really once, once nothing in our society works anymore, we'll still have tabletop role-playing games, you know, like that's not, it's not going anywhere. My kids can be the bards and the sages of, of whatever future post-apocalyptic landscape we live in. Um, if things go that route, let's hope we don't. Um, and let's just talk about normal life. I do think, you know, the ability to tell to do creative storytelling. Um, I think the number one way for me is collaboration. Like the ability to sit down at a, a table with a bunch of different people who have different perspectives and then to layer on top of that, not just the player motivations, but the character motivations, how that character operates. That's two layers of critical thinking you have to consistently get into when you're playing role-playing games um, if, if you want to tell a good story. And asking your kids to think about those things kind of reinforces that. Then, then we back out and it's easy to say, hey, when you get into a, a work situation or when you get into a social situation and you know that people are operating at cross odds with each other, that people have different motivations, different desires, different ways they're operating, you actually will know not only how to navigate those social situations better, but actually how to bring cohesion and collaboration potentially between disagreeing parties. Um, I also think most role-playing games do a good job of reinforcing um, major kind of lore realities. So, um, you know, whether that's Greek mythology, whether that is, um, you know, European fantasy, whether that is a lot of other things. Um, and I think we'll see progressively over the course of the next few years, um, more and more cultural exploration of things that are not just white European fantasy. Um, there's, a, there's a Kickstarter coming up this month um, about uh, Chinese immigrants fighting vampires whilst having to run their restaurant that's coming out by a couple of um, my friends who are both Asian game designers um, that I'm incredibly excited to see how they draw the lore of China into a role-playing setting that lets us ex everybody experience that culture a little bit more. Now it's going to be gamified, right? It's not a historical account, but it's going to teach people about that culture in different ways. I think we'll see similar things um, come out of black and African culture. I think it's a great way to be able to explore more and more as we go through what other cultures are like and have a broader worldview um, where you can explore things with the fact of a return without actual physical or emotional consequence in your real life. Now, maybe heated when you walk away from the table, like we talked about, but the reality is you're not, you don't actually have to be upset about the fake thing that didn't happen. You might be, but you don't have to have to be. Whereas when bad things happen in the real world, there are very real emotional stakes that we, we have to consider and respond to. So I think that cultural exploration thing, the ability to bring cohesion, to operate with different perspectives and with different desires and still work towards a common goal, I think are, are some of the fundamental things that any form of role playing teach you plus math. <laughs> Tony, thank you so much for all of the great advice. You've opened my eyes to some mechanics that I am definitely implementing at the table. I mean, that heat rule is fantastic. It was a blast to be on. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I would love, I, I would love to hear from other people who maybe listen to this, hit me up. Um, if you have mechanics that you love introducing with your kids or think you would want to introduce with kids, I would love to hear what they are.